excellent <laughs> guest today. Super stoked to have our guest back with us today. He's Bob in the green Hunt. room. Sherilyn, you want to introduce him? Sure. Bob Hunt has pastored for many years and serves as the director of finance at Zion's Hope. From a lifetime of studying God's word, he brings a wealth of knowledge to the insightful contextual teaching. Zion Hope seeks to graciously proclaim to the Jewish people and all people throughout the world their need for personal salvation through Jesus the Messiah. We believe prophetic scriptures indicate the Lord's return is near and that a time of intense persecution will precede his coming. Therefore, Zion's Hope fervently seeks to prepare Christians for difficult days ahead and educate the Bible-believing church concerning the place of Israel in the history of prophecy and to assist in fulfilling in its God-given obligation to include the Jewish people in its program for world evangelism. Bob, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good to see you all this morning. Did I leave anything out that you want people to know about you? Well, not really. I'm not sure I would have written all of that, but uh, <laughs> that was quite a glowing report. But I thank you for those words and the encouragement for Zion's Hope. Uh, I think just like you, we're all in this together, trying to educate yeah. and prepare the church so that they'll be ready for coming events and not what I would say, asleep at the wheel. And so we're, we're in this together. So uh, glad to be back. Had fun last time. Hopefully, we'll have fun again. So, yeah, Bob, glad to have you on. So enjoyed our conversation last time. You bring such a wealth of of knowledge that I know you've humbly uh, sought the Lord on in His Word. Uh, but we and we love Zion Hope. We love what you guys are doing and been doing for years. Uh, you know, I think probably many people listening are very familiar uh, with your work because over. Pretty much anybody who is listening to this program, anybody that uh, we come in contact with who has a view of preparing for challenges ahead, who has a view of a later tribulation, later rapture time in the tribulation, all have been impacted by uh, Marv Rosenthal's book uh, on, on the pre-wrath view. And of course, he's uh, started your ministry, the founder of it, and uh, y'all conti you're continuing that work with him. And so we're so glad to have, and of course, we, we have such a heart for Israel. And so we love what you guys are doing. And so again, thank you for being here. Well, well, Bob, uh, you like myself and many of the viewers here, uh, lean heavily towards the Antichrist being from the Middle East, and then the, therefore likely being uh, from the re uh, revived Ottoman Empire, Islamic Caliphate. Um, and so when you're here last time, we talked about the identity of the Antichrist. But today, today I want to talk about his rise to power because that, to me, I've been blown away just how much scripture gives about the actual rise and, and yeah. all of how that go, you know, is going to happen. And so just kind of start off with what would be the go to passages for someone to begin to study about the, the actual rise of the Antichrist? Well, there are, there are quite a few of them that I could bring you to. When you asked me that question, I said, well, there's at least two dozen, three dozen <laughs> that we could we could follow. Which would surprise uh, many people, I think, to hear that yeah. there would be that many. Yeah, I mean, I'll just give you some verses, and then I'll kind of touch on a couple of them a little more in depth that I think are very relevant to today. Because as I thought of the rise of the Antichrist, that's where we are. Um you know, ultimately, we're looking for Christ, but we know before that the Antichrist will be allowed to re rise up. But of course, everybody's favorite is Revelation chapter 13, you know, where the beast rises up out of the sea. And following um, Daniel chapter 7 um, will take us through the fourth beast. And of course, you can get some information in there, and we'll touch on that briefly. Um, chapter 9 of Daniel. Uh, has, you know, the 70 weeks of Daniel, the seven-week mm -hmm. final period outline. That's a great place to go to. Uh, I like Revelation chapter 17, uh, Mystery Babylon. We can learn mm -hmm. a lot about um, the beast again and the Antichrist. And I'm going to touch on a couple things in there. And again, I'm not going to have a lot of time, but I'll just touch. Yeah. Second Thessalonians chapter... Two, uh, we see the uh, revealing of the man of sin or the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist. And 
know, we see a couple of events that are critical uh, prior to um, the return of Christ, which is his unveiling of the Antichrist and also the apostasy that is found there. So those are also good verses. Um, again, everybody's favorite this time of, the, uh, this time of history is uh, Revelation 13 when we talk about the mark of the beast, but those are real events. Uh, yeah. that you can learn about some of the things that will be happening around the world during the time of the Antichrist. And so we can expect uh, nothing, nothing short of that happening. And so those would be the areas I could go to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, look at Gog. A lot of people miss that, yeah. but uh, know that that is the Antichrist. Take it to Isaiah chapter 11, where it talks about a figure called the Assyrian, the Assyrian. And so does Micah. Uh, those are also talking about the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 11, the second half of Daniel 11, is primarily focused on the Antichrist. The first half is focused on, you know, historical character, Antiochus Epiphanes. And, uh, but it transitions into the Antichrist and his uh, work. And he's called the King of the North. King of the North, and you see an interesting battle between the King of the North, King of the South, and again, we don't have time to go into it, but let me just say here at this point is that the King of the North is the Antichrist, and the King of the South would most likely be the harlot, and that there will be a battle between the two at the end, and I will bring us to Revelation 17 just to quickly point out that how that ends and so uh, Zechariah chapter 12 through 14 all pointing to events uh, of the Antichrist and the coming of Christ and, and the battle that'll surround Jerusalem uh, at that time and many people would be surprised that maybe Jerusalem would be in the midst of a battle of that significance because most people look at the Valley of Megiddo or Armageddon the only battle, but like most wars, it's multifaceted. It has various parts of the globe yes. in the Middle East will be affected, so it shouldn't surprise us. So yes, it's all over the Bible. It's all over the Old Testament. Yeah, you know, it, it blows me away. Like, I, I mean, I've been a student of Scripture for years, uh, you know, devoted myself to vocational ministry, to, you know, seminary, to just being a student of Scripture. And really, it wasn't up till a few years ago that I was just realizing it's tons, it's tons in here, you know, in so many details. And I, I just so many times would just buy into the lie. We can't know. You just can't know. It's such a mystery. But with that many passages, surely we can know something, right? That's right. correct. And not only that is if you're going to really look into prophecy, a lot of people will focus on one section like Revelation, say, yeah. Here's my focus. I read Revelation, so I know everything there is to know. Wrong. <laughs> the Old Testament probably has more to say. Right. And you need to sit down with all of these scriptures side by side mm -hmm. and examine what are they saying? What's God talking about through each prophet? And tie these things together. Maybe make notes of what this particular prophet is trying to communicate. And now you've got a big picture. And really, that has to do with any doctrine of the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not focused one verse, one paragraph, one not even one chapter or book of the Bible. It's it's an entire book giving right. us one message, and that yes. includes the end time. So mm -hmm. we need to be careful to do that. Bob, can you – were you done? I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? No, nope, nope. go ahead. Can you tell us um, – Afghanistan, you know, a lot of people want to know what's going on in Afghanistan and how that might relate to Bible prophecy. Okay. I have some thoughts on that. Um, as I, I told Jake, um, yeah, Muhammad actually talked about um, that area uh, when he was alive. And he wrote, or I'll say allegedly wrote, because there's even some dispute, but they're probably real, but he wrote several what are called hadiths. And these are sayings that people wrote down about what he said. Mm -hmm. Now, 
he wrote several hadiths concerning an area called Khorasan. Khorasan. Mm -hmm. Today, that would be some of Iran, Afghanistan, all of it, maybe a little bit into Pakistan. And so he talked about these black flags or black banners coming out of Khorasan or Afghanistan. Let me read you just one. I picked one. There are, there are a bunch of them. But the one that caught my attention is, is this. There will emerge from Khorasan black banners, which nothing will repel until they are set up in Jerusalem. So you can see where are these black flags coming from? Khorasan, which is Afghanistan. Where are they going? Jerusalem. Well, what kind of flags are these? They're flags of the, of the uh, jihad, the warrior flag um, intended to uh, gather the troops of, of Islamic people and bring them to Jerusalem. So we know the Islamic people want to get into Jerusalem. It's a holy site for them. It's a, it's a shrine for them. The mosque is there. They want to get there. But it's interesting that Muhammad on more than one occasion pointed to Afghanistan and told the people, the Islamic people, to look for these black flags. These black flags, you know, have words on them. And they basically it's what they call the creedal shahadra, which, you know, says Allah is one true God and Muhammad is his messenger, his prophet. Now, as we look at Afghanistan today and what's going on, the Taliban now has pretty much taken over the country. The, they have renamed it. Um, instead of, you know, Afghanistan, they, they want it to be called um, the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan. And they've been around, that name's been around since 1996. But it's never been recognized in history before as an official name. Mm. It's currently, if you've noticed, China is giving credence to the name as Russia is, as many other countries. Mm. It's appearing that they will become an official state. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, the Taliban is still the Al Qaeda. It's a birthplace for radical Islam and it will grow and it will become a place where islamic radicals will uh, gather be trained and really they take seriously the black flags if you look at the taliban's twitter page and it's interesting they have a twitter page yeah, it is. because so many of our elected officials do not right but the, the headlines under their Twitter name talks about the black flag prophecy, which is very interesting. So you can see a sense of what they're trying to do. They're trying to stir up the Islamic people into a fever pitch, into a zeal. Mm. And I will tell you, a lot of the Islamics have a zeal that I wish Christians had for yes, end times. Yes. yes. They, take, they, they take very seriously end times. They get excited. And yep. they are excited now. I looked around the world at different uh, leaders of Islam, and they're talking about the black flags. Mm. Now, I want to put a little warning in here. Islamic prophecy is not biblical prophecy. We don't look through the eyes of Islamic prophecy to see the Bible. We do just the opposite. How does this fit into biblical prophecy? I think it's because when the Taliban or when the Islamic people look at what's going on there and they hear about the black bags, they get excited because they know or they feel that the Mahdi, their savior, their figure, key figure, is about to arise in their thoughts. And they will do everything they can to make that happen because they've been told it's up to you. Mm. You know, if we get excited, if we push, if we go out, the Mahdi will appear and 
Islam mm-hmm. will overtake the world and become the one world religion. And yeah. you know, I look at the nation of Iran right next to Pakistan. They scare me the most yes. because yes. of their religious fever. Mm-hmm. Their goal is a, this is a religious war to them. And they want to set up badly their, their banner in, in Jerusalem. So right next door. And so when I see what's going on in Afghanistan, you know, it, it may not be directly a biblical prophecy, but it certainly is bringing us down to, ro- to the road to where the Islamic people are going to want to probably make a move to, and that will fulfill yeah. Islamic prophecy. So we need to pay attention. And don't forget Pakistan. Yeah, Bob, you, oh. what you're talking about seems very reminiscent of what happened in Iraq with ISIS. And I, it, it seems like we're seeing something very similar. Uh, but would would you agree that, you know, the ISIS was very small time to even what the Taliban and what this surge could be? Would it, do you, would you agree Absolutely. with that? I totally agree with that because look at look at where Afghanistan is located and the support for their movement. Iraq was isolated. You had Iran on one side, Turkey on the other. They both wanted Iraq. And they were sort of battling each other for that territory with ISIS in between. Mm-hmm. Well, Pakistan is on one side of Afghanistan and Iran's on the other. And they're, they're not exactly upset with each other on what's going on. Pakistan's been a silent partner of the Al-Qaeda Taliban movement for 20 years. They have been uh, supplying the Taliban with all of their military and their training. And a lot of it was done within the Pakistani borders and being infiltrated into Afghanistan. But now that's no longer needed. Pakistan now can supply fully all of their needs. But an interesting Mm -hmm. thing is who's next to Pakistan? China. China. And we know the world power that China. Should it surprise Mm -hmm. us that China has formed some sort of alliances with Iran. Yeah. Are they what should surprise us that China is jumping on the bandwagon to recognize this new uh, uh, Islamic Emirates? There's a lot of power behind the Chinese and their government. Mm-hmm. So yes, I see this as a different kind of uh, a, a rising, as you would, of the Islamic uh, nation. And people say, well, it's, it's radical. Well, mm-hmm. Islam, I'll tell you, is radical. And oh, if you follow yes. the Quran and the Hadith, yes. and if you're a loyal Islamist Muslim, uh, it's a radical uh, religion. So yeah. I'd be keeping yeah. a close eye on that area. I mean, and we they're just carrying out their, their teaching and they're, you know, they're carrying out what they're called to do as, as faithful. Bob, I'm going to go off script for a minute, uh, and I, I probably shouldn't do this. But in the book of Revelation, we, we hear about this army coming from the east. And, and I, I know a lot of, uh, you know, I've always people talked about that being China and things like that. Uh, that seems to possibly correlate with the, uh, you know, the idea in uh, within within Islam that uh, that there would be these this surge from the east that would really k- kick things off and, and usher that in. Yeah, a lot of people looked at it. I think what you're referencing is the 200 million yeah. uh, person army in, in Revelation. And I think it's chapter 16. Um, and, and I believe this is part of uh, the six bowl judgment, which is initiated by God. Yeah. And he's the one that's going to uh, open the way. He's going to dry up the Euphrates River so that this can happen. And so in some way... I'm not sure I'd jump and say this is a fulfillment of that. Right, right. But could it be connected? I would say sure can. Uh, yeah. God could mm-hmm. use this to open up that whole entryway because certainly China has the manpower. Yes. Now there's an avenue. And with the, uh, you know, with all of the power China has, they certainly could fight a proxy war through mm-hmm. the Islamic people uh, to take down uh, Israel. And yes. form some kind of deal with Iran. I mean, that that's a straightway shot that would uh, scare anybody. 
China's army, China's army is 2.3 million. That's what I just looked up. So we only have a few minutes left. And I'm Jake. I just want to thank you for being here, Bob. And I know Jake might have some more questions, but I do want to give a shout out to our brother from Sri Lanka who's watching. Thank you. And all those who have been giving great comments, Doug and Kelly and all those. Thank you so much. We want to thank you for uh, just supporting us, supporting one another. And Bob, we want you to tell us about Zion's Hope and how people can support you there. Yes, uh, well, Zion's Hope, I mean, you did a pretty good job of, of telling people who we are. Uh, we are a ministry that's been around for, for quite a few years. Marv and Marbeth Rosenthal uh, were integral in starting it. Um, their people was for the love of Jews, mm. and it was also to teach people uh, eschatology and doctrine and even the things just about Christ. And so we've been supporting several missionaries in Israel. These are not missionaries we sent from the United States to Israel. These are people who have lived there and have grown up actually with Marv over the years. I mean, these missionaries are second, third generation. That's how long Marv's been involved. Wow. So we have many programs and we'll have one coming up called Servant's Heart here pretty soon where we will try to help out the people in Israel by bringing literature, Bibles in their own Hebrew language, Sunday school material, help the Holocaust victims, bring food to the the needy uh, and those kind of things. We help a pro-life center, a education Christian school. And so we'll be promoting that here in another uh, month or so, and uh, hopefully people will support that. The hundred percent goes over to the missionaries, and they will help, you know, take care of the programs. Normally, we go; somebody from the United States goes, but you know the difficulties that we'll have with that. But one way or another, we'll help the people. Mm-hmm. On the other side is the teaching ministry. Uh, go to Zion's Hope. Dot org onto the website. You'll see loads and loads of videos on uh, current events, on eschatology, and, and some just on uh, key doctrines in the Bible. And the last thing is on Zion's Fire, which is a magazine that we publish uh, bi-monthly. Um, and again, we cover key issues. And hmm. so that's really who we are. And um, If someone wanted to contact you personally, can they do that, and how would they do that? Yeah, they could contact me via my email, uh, which is my name, Bob Hunt, at zionshope.org. And, Wonderful. Uh, that will come directly to me. Bob, uh, Bob, you've given us so much great information, stuff to think about. Jake, do you have anything else? Yeah, we've got a few more minutes. And so, Bob, I want to take us back to you started with walking through those passages. Yeah, and, I got uh, one in particular. Yeah. Well, Wonderful. Yes. Um, it has to do with the covenant, because um, oh, a lot of people have asked about the covenant. Is it is it out there? Are we, are we seeing right. it? Do we yes. know anything about it? And, and that probably is the next key item on the, the list of eschatology. And I just want to bring people's attention to two things that have been happening in the world. Um, I think they're both kind of low key, but one is called Abraham Accord. Yes. Um, the peace yes. agreement that uh, President Trump uh, helped broker, uh, and it's been one year now, August 13, 2020. It hasn't got a lot of press, but it's still active. And uh, that peace agreement with the UAE, uh, with Bahrain, Morocco, and now Syria, and hopefully Saudi Arabia, uh, very interesting to watch because you know, in order to have certain events like building a temple in Jerusalem, peace between these people groups will be necessary. So as this moves forward, uh, we need to be paying attention to that. That could be a significant event. Could that be the agreement that we're waiting for? It's possible. Then there's another event that's going on also in the UAE, and that is uh, called the Abrahamic Family House uh, this is where the Catholic Church, through Pope Francis, the uh, Islamic people, 
and the uh, Jewish people are all building their own three separate uh, worship centers on the same plot of land. Mm. They are 20% done, but they are going to show the world how to coexist, where we can have spiritual tolerance over our similarities and ignore our differences. Well, I looked at that and I said, well, what if that ever moved over to the Temple Mount? Yeah. Mm. Is that possible? Well, if this works, and it has so far, I'd be watching how that works very closely. Interestingly, all three of those religions proclaim a, what I would call a false Jesus. You know, of course, you know, uh, the Islamic people, you know, promote Isa as their Jesus who didn't die, who didn't atone for our sins, who, you know, got lifted up like Muhammad supposedly did. And then you have uh, the Jewish people who just proclaim Christ as a man and, uh, yes. you know, deny his, <laughs> yeah, they deny his deity. I, I remember when I was in Tel Aviv and with a group in there and some man came over and spit at our feet and said, Jesus, just a man. And he went on to describe his bodily function. So they have half the story, but not the full Jesus. And uh, the Catholic Church denies the sufficiency of Christ and what he did mm -hmm. on the cross because of the other things you have to do. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I say they're all false Jesus, but the spiritual tolerance, the unity they're trying to bring. So as I look at the peace treaty, the Abraham Accords, more of a political, maybe even a, a national thing, combine that with a, a drive to spiritually unify I'm getting a pretty good picture of a beast harlot unification spoken of in Revelation 17, verse 3, where the beast is being ridden by the harlot, indicating a partnership between the two. So I'm watching those events really closely, how they unfold and how the world reacts to them. So I, I didn't want to leave without at least touching upon uh, those two events to, to watch and, and see if those perhaps unfold into something uh, more significant. Well, we'd like to have you come back on, Bob, especially if those events do get, you know, unfold more and become more significant. And I never thought of the harlot riding the beast as something like that. So thank you for opening my eyes yeah, to that. I, I, I would love to explain that a little bit more. I don't have time, but the one thing is it, it's, a, it's an alliance between the beast, which we call the Antichrist, and the harlot. And the harlot, I believe, is is a, is a religion of Islam. I got to tell you, the Antichrist could care less about Islam, but he will use it to his end. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you drop down to Revelation 17, 16. What do you see? The beast kills the harlot. In the end, the Antichrist could care less about Islam, but he will use that religion to destroy Jerusalem if he can. Uh, but in the end... Out goes Islam, and he will proclaim himself through the Antichrist, and he will try and uh, ascend, as he says in Isaiah 14, to the throne. But we mm. know how that ends. But anyway, fascinating passage, a lot yes. more to it than that, but uh, it's all very interesting as we look at our world and, and see how God is speaking to us through you, real experiences. You've Incredible. clarified a lot to me. And, and Bob, when you're talking about uh, the covenant, you're referring to Daniel 9, right? Uh, yes, the, uh, uh, yes, 9.27. And so what you're saying, that, the next step we're looking for is that affirming of that, that covenant. Is that what you would, would say? I, I would say that's the, the next significant event because that's the beginning of Daniel's 70th week. Yes. The seven-year period they call the tribulation, which I don't agree with that title. But uh, anyway, it's going to start the clock ticking. Yeah. And um, that would be an exciting time, but also uh, a very perilous time, as Timothy, as Paul told Timothy. And so, but what a time to live. Amen, Bob. We, we're going to take one more minute because do you have something you want to tell you, us about the end times? What, what, how, how should we stand firm? What do you want to tell us? If you only have one minute to tell us something, Tell it All to right. us now. I'll tell you what I told our staff a couple of weeks ago. Are you ready? Are you ready? And by that, I mean, 
yes, it's nice to be prepped and have food and, and all of that because, you know, I think most people see that. But are you ready to endure the persecution that's coming? Because if you look at the revelation, you'll see that those that are destined for captivity will be captured and those that are destined to die will die. Have you prepared your heart? Have you prepared your faith? Have you asked God to get you ready for this? I mean, we can't be nonchalant. You know, standing firm, that, that ties, dovetails right into this message because we it's coming. It's not some doctrine sitting out there that, you know, hey, yeah, I know. No, it, it looks like it's becoming more and more real. For us here in the United States, uh, it's real all over the world for many, many nations. And we hear lots of stories, but I think that would be my message to your viewers, and to whomever I talk to. We need to prepare ourselves that we can stand firm for God, give him the glory and give him the honor, uh, no matter if it's prison or if it's martyrdom. So, John, that's, that, that's perfect. Thank you. I mean, I don't know if I should thank you, or, but yes, we need to hear it. I need to hear it. So, Jake, any last words? And, Don, thank you so much. Yeah, no, uh, Bob, thank you so much. Uh, Why did incredible. I say Don? I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> Busted. Uh, but, Bob, we, we thank you so much. I was so thinking much. of donning my armor. That's what I was yeah, thinking That's true. That's the way to do armor. it. Bob, we, we hope you'll, you'll, you'll stick on after clothes. I'd like to speak to you a minute, but uh, we're, we're so glad to have uh, have you on and be a part of this. And I encourage everyone, check out Zion's Hope. Their teaching is incredible, incredible content. Uh, and I know you agree with their message and what they're doing. Follow them. Great, great resources out there. And uh, keep uh, praying for us here at Stand Firm as we continue to help, help you navigate such a time as this and encouraging you to uh, stand firm. We'll be back at it next Thursday night uh, with our teaching stand firm and back doing this. Our talking stand firm will continue talking about the Antichrist next week as we have our friend Jaron Lewis on uh, from Ambassadors of Christ. And they're talking about their new film, their new documentary on the rise of the Antichrist. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. God bless you. And don't forget, if you have any questions, Jake at stanfordministries.com. Join us next week. God bless.